ladies and boys, germs and girls. We're back for another episode of the Body Beauty Show. And we are with Perry Nixdorf uh, from Paradise Salon Spa and Wellness. He is a veteran of the show. We had him back on the podcast. Gosh, it was, I think it was, I can't recall the exact episode, but it was uh, a few months back and he was a fantastic guest. And given that everybody demanded him to come back, we have invited him back and he's here with us today. So Perry, thanks for being on the show. How goes it? It goes great. Thanks for having me on the show, Austin. Of course, we're delighted to have you. So I think, you know, we, we did a lot of planning for this uh, episode, an abnormal amount of planning, which is good because I think it's going to be high quality constant for the listeners. But one of the things that we figured out was missing in the educational space that is podcast land, is that most shows go like this. They bring a guest on and they ask them a thousand questions they've already answered in a thousand other episodes of a thousand different podcasts in the past. Where are you from? What did you do? How'd you get your start? That is regurgitation. What we also see are things like buyer's guides. Hey, you should do this, do this, do this. But what there's a real dearth of is an industry veteran. So in the case of Perry listeners, Perry is an industry veteran in the hair universe and the adjacent swim lanes of 40 years running a highly successful uh, spa in, Perry, remind me the exact city. I know you're near Carson me. City, Nevada. That's right. Okay, Carson City, Nevada. In a 7,000 plus square foot space from a 900 square foot space ages ago. So needless to say, if, you, if you're if you in the hair universe, Perry is the guy. So what has been missing historically is access to an expert's brain as they think through, so call it a thinker's guide, on how they pivot into an adjacent, say, swim lane. So I would love, Perry, as a starting point, if you could give the listeners a bit of an idea as to what the project is that you're embarking on and some context here, and then we'll get started. I'll lay out an agenda for what the listener can expect from the, uh, the show today. But let's, as a starting point, talk through the project that you're working on now and why you've decided to jump into an adjacent swim lane. Which project are you talking about here, Austin? So we're talking about the, the med spa. The, the med spa. Conjunct certainly. bolt on to the yeah. spa you have today. Yep. As, as I explained to you earlier, we have multiple projects going on, right? That's, that's kind of my life is full of projects. So yeah, so the med spa, um, we have a wellness facility. We cater to people who are looking for anti-aging qualities in their life through fitness, through body decoration, body adornment, hair, and um, having a med spa fits very well within our ideal situation where we want to deliver more services to those, those clients. We feel it's very complimentary to provide Botox and Restylane and you know, some laser treatments and whatever else we decide to do in that, in that zone, we, which we haven't completely defined yet. So that's why you and I are going to talk this through a little bit. That's right. So again, listeners, the idea here, the context of the conversation is to get a glimpse into a veteran in the space as they think through how they decide what to do and importantly, or equally importantly, what not to do, where to allocate capital, resources, time, staff, energy, et cetera. So here's what you can expect from today's conversation. At least this is what we have laid out uh, and in the spirit of time, we do anticipate getting through most of it, uh, but this is what we have as a roadmap for the conversation today. So number one, this is a five-fold agenda. Number one is setting, defining, and reimagining your goals and ambition. Remember that people without vision perish. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is risk management, insights, and how to sleep at night, because turns out having sanity is important. And that's in short supply these days. And number three is getting the info that you need and weeding out what you don't. So there's an interesting idea on the noise bottleneck that Nassim Tlaib talks about. I believe it's Nassim Tlaib, but we'll get into that later on. That's third. Fourth is overcoming the influences within your zone of influence. And then lastly, well, how do we put it all together and execute, execute, execute on your vision? So let's start from square one. 
no better square to start with. So goal setting. So Perry, talk to me about how you visualize and determine what the heck you want to pursue with the business and the businesses that you operate and what not to do. So how do you get clarity of focus and intent? How do you personally go about thinking through that? I have a pretty clear vision of what my ideal scene looks like, right? Every, I drive up to my building and I go, that is mostly what I want to produce. Maybe it's not what I want to do. Um, but I have a very clear vision of what the customer should experience when they walk in my door, what services I would like to provide and what services I don't provide, um, but I could provide. Um, so for even from the day I opened this building, I knew that my ultimate goal would be to have a med spa component to my building. Um, it wasn't initially done because it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, didn't have quite the connections for it. We had all this other stuff to do. We had the salon to set up, the piercing, the pool, and we had to establish that. And that was our core business. And so at this point in time, it's now in my mind that I want to expand because everything else is pretty well set up and I want to add those services to my offerings. So mm -hmm. it's all about my ideal scene that's sitting in my head that says, this is what it would look like in a perfect world. I think a lot of people struggle with selection. There's so many options. It's, it's this phenomenon that they call the paradox of choice. I have so that ha happen to me all the time. Yeah. So, so how do you delineate do from do not? I mean, is there some sort of heuristic, some sort of lens you see these, these decisions through? Talk us through what that looks like specifically. There's any tactical insight on that? Yeah. Um, I have some particular policies, definitions of wellness. What is wellness to us, right? And so um, I try to stick to that. Um, I try to stick to things that are somewhat in my wheelhouse, if not mostly in my wheelhouse. Um, not that I don't ever venture outside of that, but it, it, it has to do with my purpose, I guess, is really what it comes down to. What is the purpose of my business, my, my, my mental business, you might say, right? As far as what do I want to accomplish? I want to help people. Do I want to make a lot of money? Do I want to... Um, you know, whatever, whatever the purpose is, right? Am I building a legacy for myself? Um, those are the kind of things that, that, that I have pretty defined for myself. Um, you know, for us, the purpose is to help people make better decisions about their life and to provide the services and products necessary in order to accomplish that. That's in a nutshell what my purpose is. So my goals and my ideal scenes and all that stuff wraps up around that. So when you, when you say ideal scene, I'm assuming there's some literal visual component to that. So you walk into your, your spa five years down the line. Are you, are you literally seeing what that looks like? Or maybe you could speak to what the ideal scene means to you and how you've, you've drummed that up. Well, the ideal scene is an unaccomplishable vision of what your business should look like. Okay, that's ultimately, yes, the ideal scene, part of the ideal scene is what does the physical space look like? What kind of employees do I, should I have? How should those employees um, behave and greet during the course of the day? What's, what's happening? So we have a term here called the paradise effect. When we do our job as close to our, my ideal scene as we can, people have a visceral reaction to us, which is very, very positive. They can't get enough of what we deliver. They come through and they get a service. They're back the next day getting something else. They're exploring the building. They want a tour. They just, they, they just feel really good about us and our ability to help them choose some services to accomplish their goals. But we, we call that the paradise effect. I actually created a challenge coin that had a paradise effect on it as part of the, the logo. Um, anyway, so th that's, what it's, that's what it feels like. When we do our job right, the paradise effect is in full bloom in a person's mind. Interesting. 
one thing that listeners fail to consider is in goal selection, let's say, which at some point you just have to select what is my ideal scene? What does that look like? Uh, and th there's this idea from good to great from Jim Collins of the, the BHAG, which is the big, hairy, audacious goal. Something that is just, it just seems like it's unattainable, but you know that if you put your mind to it, you can make it happen. And so what we do oftentimes, we set these goals that are not BHAG. They're too, they're too attainable. They're too easy to reach because you don't want to fail. Yeah, so I, I, call those I call those targets. They're not goals. They're targets. A very big difference in those. Huh. So it, it, it does seem like it's somewhat obvious, but what do you mean in, in terms of that distinction? Because this goal selection piece is important if you're going to invert yes. you know, in mind, select the right ideal scene. So how do you think of target versus goal then in that context? Well, the, the goal is to accomplish your ideal scene. All right. Targets are larger um, things that have to be accomplished for you to get that, but there's multiple of those. Hmm. All right. So targets are, are a subset of to accomplish your goal. Hmm. And for that, you have to have a plan, right? So the, so once you have this ideal scene, then your, your mind starts to form a plan. And from that plan, you develop targets. So for me, my ideal scene is to have a med spa component in my building. So the plan is, okay, well, in order to do that, we need to carve out a piece of space that, that we have and make that space part of that. So that's one target is to create the legit, the physical space possible for that. Can I do that? What do I need to do that? That kind of stuff, right? Another target is you have to develop, you have to um, have the right manage management because I can't do all of this myself. So I need to have a competent management person. So how do you go about getting that person? We have to have competent delivery people along with the products necessary. And we have to, and that delivery person will have certain skill sets, which will then define what services we can offer. So if I could find a competent delivery person that's been in the industry and knows this a little bit, then my selection of services will be a little bit larger. If I'm finding somebody new and I have to train them, um, my delivery selection will be a little bit smaller at first as we grow and um, develop that person's skill sets. So these are each one of those is a target, but they're, they ultimately fit into the ideal scene. Hmm. So it's fair to say that everything, every course of action you take, every decision you make, every staff you hire or person you hire, every tool you implement and everything in between is subservient to the attainment of the ideal scene. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I was just thinking this is a, uh, an aside, but a riff off of the paradox of choice. I was thinking, you know, as a part of your ideal scene architecture, if you attain it, maybe instead of a paradox of choice being created for your customers, you create a, wait for it, a paradise. Ah, uh, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> well, you anyway, know, that, he, one's here's, free. Here's, that one's here's free, Perry. Thing. Here's the thing, Austin, you, you know, that, that goal being that it's so awesome and so huge, it's never really obtainable. And it's, and it's modified by your purpose. So let's pretend that I accomplish my goal here at, at this physical location and everything is running smoothly. Well, my purpose is still driving me and it modifies that goal that says, well, you have one location, can you do this in two locations? Or can you expand out on this, right? So my purpose has driven me to do the app version of my plan, you know, because I have it's it's all related to my purpose. And as long as my purpose is clear, um, the that goal will never be obtainable 100%. But all the targets will be obtainable. That's that's the thing that ideal scene is never obtainable. But your targets are obtainable. Frequently, your goals will have some KPIs attached to them. So you're going to get some obtainability of that. It's not like you're pursuing a goal forever and it never gets there. But that ideal scene is pretty much never, ever accomplishable 
um, because life doesn't give it to you that way. You always have staff issues, you have um, product issues, you have vendor issues, you have physical location issues, you have weather, you have, you know, I mean, there, there, there is a list of obstacles to achieve your ideal scene every day that is ultimately insurmountable. You can only work every day to get as close to that ideal scene as you can. And by the way, that's what makes it fun. And by Correct. the way, that's literally how your neurochemistry is architected. If you consider dopamine, it is a it is fuel for goal attainment. We're literally Correct. wired to do that. So if you're not setting BHAGs or taking the time listeners to really think through what your ideal scene is, or maybe a different way of saying it is beginning with the end in mind, you're missing out. And you're probably going to settle for targets instead of actual goals of which Perry is Correct. referring to. And then, the, then also the, pro the problem with that is that you finish them. And when you finish them, um, sometimes you have to reset a little bit and you have to come up with something new. But if your ideal scene and your goals are clear, um, you already see what the next step is before you even finish the target. You know, you know you're going to finish this target, but that next thing is already formulating in your mind and you already are working towards it. Yeah, exactly. So two bits on that, and then we'll jump into the next section here. The first is that if you are mission focused or purpose driven or some derivative of that, you literally cannot fail. And here's what I mean. You might miss a target. You might miss your goal. But if your intention is to do X, let's say um, for us at Artemis, it's to empower entrepreneurs to help their or our clients get the resources they need so that their customers can feel confident in their skin. Okay, something to that effect. That is a mission that we cannot fail at. If our intention going into every interaction with every potential partner of ours is that we can't lose because you can't Correct. fail if your intention's right. So Correct. this is this is these are all parts of the architecture of your your ideal scene formation. Um, one last note that's relevant uh, actually from Bill Gates uh, when it comes to selecting the goals and the ideal scene that you want to carve out is again from Bill Gates, and here it is. So at a quote. Most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. So how does that relate to BHAGs and ideal scenes? So BHAGs, again, big, hairy, audacious goals. Dream and think and play bigger. Correct. Yeah. And that's a great book, by the way. Play bigger. Uh, play bigger, excuse me. Great, 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 great book on category creation and all the rest of that I would encourage listeners to uh, to listen to. Okay, so let's let's jump into the second section here because I think what, you know, people can come up with goals. I don't want to say all day long because many people don't have goals, of course, or ideal scenes or otherwise. But let's say they do land in a place where, hey, I've got a mission. I've got purpose. It's mapped out. It's articulated. Maybe I have my value set. Uh, I've thought through what I want my ideal scene to look like the toys I want to implement, staff, et cetera, but I'm scared. There's risk. There's risk. So let's get into some of this risk management stuff and figure out if there's uh, uh, some, some frameworks, heuristics, or otherwise that you lean on that are helping you today navigate how you decide which direction you want to take your business. So well, yeah, I, I can go add, ahead. Go yeah, ahead. yeah risk is, is relative to knowledge. Um, the more you know about something, the less risk there is. Um, and so oftentimes when I set my goals, um, I don't have a great deal of knowledge about it. I have this vision that says, oh, this would be really cool, but I don't know enough about it. Um, so the, my first step is to try to learn as much as I can about it. Um, the 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 caveat here is that you can spend all day reading and get sidetracked so easily and you know so much about other things that you don't necessarily get the information you need. So um, I try to formulate something in my head that says, what information do I actually need? So I'll make myself a little list um, of what I think my, my most likely obstacles are going to be. And then I try to find specific information related to those exact obstacles. 
so that I don't find myself reading uh, books and books and books about things that are interesting and might benefit me, but I'm looking for exact information about how to overcome particular obstacles. And the knowledge about that allows me to move forward. Once that happens, I find more obstacles. I, I can fine tune my obstacles. Um, I might even not pursue the goal because, because I find that uh, the, mar the market is saturated or you know there's things that you find out. You just go, oh, this was a great idea, but really other people had this idea and really um, it's not all that great. Or maybe it is, maybe you know, my, my little niche vision is all that's necessary to succeed over somebody else. Um, but I try to narrow it down so that I'm not looking at everything and focused on particular types of information. So how do you sift information that is pertinent and relevant from that, which is not. And then further, how do you know when you have enough to make a decision? I try to find usability. There's, if you um, look at a lot at articles, blog articles, especially right now we have, um, we have a marketing tool, the SEO marketing tool provides 500 to 750 word blogs everywhere on the internet. Many of them are feel good articles. They are articles on what you, how things ought to be and what somebody's doing and, you know, that kind of stuff. But they don't really have step by step tools that are clear and concise. So it's hard to sift through that sometimes. But once in a while, you find um, a particular author that writes some things that are a lot more focused. Sometimes they want you to pay for it because they know what's out there and um, what's not out there. You know? So there's people who are making a living at that. So you have to kind of look at that and say, well, is this worth paying for or is it not um, through their literature? And sometimes you buy stuff that, it, you know, you get fooled because they say they're going to deliver and then they don't. But it's, you have to stay focused and I try to find things that are very specifically related to problem solving that have a useful nature to them that if I do this, I will accomplish something and very few articles are like that. Most of them I find are specific from manufacturers. Um, so we, I try to find things that are as close to the source of the material as possible. So if I want to learn about cryotherapy, I'm not going to go learn from some blogger, I'm going to go to a cryotherapy manufacturer's website, and or an expert who's delivering classes on cryotherapy and, and that type of stuff. I'm not going to just pick up some blog written by some company that thinks they need some SEO backlinks to their website. Um, because it, it, it never really is good enough information. So I spend a lot of time sifting through that, but I'm, I have a vision, I know what I'm looking for, and I just keep looking. I think one of the things that listeners should be sensitive to is this notion of the noise bottleneck that I alluded to in the beginning, which is a, I think it's an idea that was put forth in, I think the book was Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, I believe, could be wrong there. I think it's him. But it's this idea that when, when you take in more information, if there are two poles on a spectrum, noise and signal, signals truth, signals what you need to hear and know, et cetera. And noise is, you know, the bloggers you mentioned who are, uh, there's some sort of incentive structure that's misaligned with what you need, let's say, and they're giving you bad information, you end up getting duped. So the noise bottleneck is this idea that you, you know, if you take in more data info, you're subjecting yourself potentially to increasing the bandwidth of noise and reducing the amount of signal that you're getting, which can actually lead to worse decisions. So what, what are you sniffing out as you figure out, okay, well, this source of information is just demonstrably terrible, run from it. These guys are great, run to it. You mentioned the manufacturers as being a good go-to, but are there things that you pick up, like you're reading an article, literature or something, and you realize, oh my God, this is obviously... <laughs> This is danger. Get out of this water. Jump over here. This is my trusted advisor type source. Yeah. How do you think about that? Yeah, I look at I look at statistics. 
Um, I try to find real numbers. Um, I often use like Google Scholar instead of, um, you know, Google News. Um, you know, trying to find, you know, so where people have studied stuff and they've filtered it down. Um, I try to look at the, you know, some of the 10 best things, you know, as a, as a starting point. Uh, everybody wants to give you a little list of the 10 best things, right? Um, so I kind of look at that as a starting point and then I sort of dig in and, um, and then I start to think, well, how is this going to directly help me resolve this particular problem? And then if it doesn't, I move on and I find something else. It's very, very, well, it's not really clear in my head because there's all this noise, right? And I have the day-to-day -day yeah. noise of everything else I do as well. But ultimately speaking, I have a pretty good um, thing going on in my head that says, this is valuable information, this is not. Um, and oftentimes I tend to gravitate to people who have written books um, because when they've written a book, they have taken the time to really filter their own thoughts into something that's succinct and delivered in a way that um, I can digest. Um, there are classes and courses that you can take. There are, you know, stuff. I try to find things that, that are undercut all the other stuff. So if I know this information, it makes sense out of all this other noise, mm. um, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the medical spa. So for me, my biggest obstacle is, um, finding a lawyer to create a, um, a contract with a doctor that I found, um, and what, and, and so on and so forth. And it is incredibly difficult to figure out, um, which lawyer you want to use because everyone says we can do this for you. Well, not everyone. Number one, there's very few of them out there. They want money to be to start with. And oftentimes you spend some money and you talk to them and it's like, oh, you really don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that's the obstacle that I'm in the middle of at the moment. Um, so finding the right lawyer and finding the right legal stuff. And you'd be surprised. I, I go to the NRSs, right? The Nevada Revised Statute. And I look at the laws themselves. And I try not to read what somebody wrote about the laws. Um, because that's much more valuable information to me, right? It doesn't have as much interpretation. So again, it, it goes back to as close to the source of the material as you can manage. So if you're talking about laws and legislation, um, you're going to need to read the NRSs and uh, the, the laws and the administrative code developed from those laws. So that when I talk to a lawyer, I'm fairly certain about what he's talking about or what he's not talking about is valid or is he's trying to tell me something that may or may not be um, pertinent to what I'm encountering. I think I just plucked out the, the, if there's any one takeaway listeners that you could grab from this conversation uh, and we are getting the hook on time. So I want to leave you guys with at least one highly actionable takeaway that actually Perry just taught me, uh, which is, thank you for that, by the way, which is this. And, and if I mischaracterize this, do uh, check me and, and, and reiterate what you've just said. But if I've caught it, I think it's this, and listeners pay attention because this is, this is more profound than you might think, okay? When it comes to getting, I'm using the term signal and noise, signal again is truth or the reality or facts or whatever versus noise, which is just clamoring static on the FM dial switch that you want to get away from because that clouds your decision-making possibility or potential for you know, accurate outcomes, et cetera, and exposes you to more risk if you don't do that. What you need to do, and this is where I need your help, Perry, to make sure I've got this codified, get as close to the source of, say, truth as possible. So here's what I mean by that specifically. I think of articles put forth by, I don't care, pick your favorite publication, CNN, Fox News, whatever. Oftentimes, those stories are seventh party they originally stem from a small town blogger where he was close to the truth. And then there's this diluting that happens as the, the story funnels up chain, let's call it. And so by the time it's broadcast on the national airwaves, 
it's diluted and it's noise and it's, and it's sensationalized. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so maybe as a closing note here, Perry, and I, I know we had the five things we wanted to get into today, but I think this is powerful for folks to take away because a lot of people today are thinking, okay, oh my gosh, I, you know, I'm a hair salon. I got to get into the spa realm or I'm a spa. I need to get in the med spa realms. So maybe I'm looking at Botox, Kybella, Sculptra, different retail products, whatever. How do I decide? And I think it's that proximity to the source that is the single greatest determinant of, are you getting accurate information that you can make your decisions on that will mitigate your risk? risk. Correct. Is that close? That is, is that, that is close. That is, that is what I'm about. Yeah. And it also helps you filter out the negativity that's in your life. Um, because if you have a great vision and you discuss it with people, most people will give you a negative response. There is, or they'll give you kind of a like, oh yeah, well, that's nice. Right. But negativity people, bias, that, yeah. right. You know, you get the, oh yeah, that's great. Looks good. You know, but what you, what, there's a lot of people that are going to say, you, you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? For instance, we went from 900 square feet to 7,000 square feet. My own mind is going, oh my God, are you crazy? But other people are saying that to me too. Oh my God, why would you want to take on such risk? Um, and you have to, if you're, if you're not armed with the knowledge, you can turn away the negativity pretty easily because you can say, well, that person doesn't know what I know. And I know more than that person. So that person's coming from an, a space that doesn't have as much validity in their knowledge as I do, right? So that's what makes the great entrepreneurs. They can filter that out. They can look at people and say, well, thank you very much, but you're not, not as knowledgeable. Um, you know, I had a lady this week. She came in. We have a competitor here that does cryotherapy and does massage and um, does some things, but they're not a med spa, right? But they do some of those things. Um, and she had a great experience there. And she came to me and says, you should do this. And, you know, and she's trying to give me all these reasons why I should take on this particular business because she liked the services, but she felt they were being delivered by unprofessional people, children, blah, blah, blah. And, and I was able to say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but that doesn't fit into what I'm doing at the moment. Unless, of course, you're the manager that knows more about this and you do this for me. Right. And of course, at that point, it's like, well, no, uh, you know, I'm retired and I don't want to do this. It's like, OK. You know, then maybe it'll happen in some time in the future, but it ain't going to happen because you told me that you want to have this in my business. Um, so. So I, I think maybe as a, as a tactical tool set that we could handle listeners, because I, you know, I'm grabbing this research article for, for body contouring uh, mechanisms of action as a, uh, a proxy or an example of the sorts of things you should be sensitive to when it comes to being as close to the source of truth as possible to show, or I guess it would be showing, but tell the listeners how you can be duped and expose yourself consequently to more risk. So if you're okay with that, we'll, we'll land the plane there. And if you have some other examples as well, I think that'd be very, very, yeah, we, we got, I got five more minutes. We're good. Okay. 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 Good deal. Good deal. So as an example, listeners, of the two things I think you should be categorically sensitive to, in fact, three, we've already covered the first when it comes to mitigating risk and managing risk so that you can sleep tonight, okay? So this is us putting what we've discussed today uh, together, hopefully in a package that'll make sense. So number one, get as close to the truth or the source of the truth as possible. That means the literature, that means the manufacturer's case studies, uh, and maybe even that is too distal from the source, but get next to the fire hydrant and stop trying to catch the water at the next block, which is a silly metaphor, but that illustrates the point. The second is be sensitive to statistics. And I'm going to illustrate that with a point here. Um, and I think a quote from Mark Twain is fitting here. And tell me if you disagree. There are lies, damn lies, and then statistics. Yes, the, statistic, the statistics um, are important, but they need to be 
um, I should say, just put in, in, in levels of importance, you know, because anybody can prove anything by some statistic. Um, yes. So, yeah, what, what's important? You know, if you're going to have weight loss, um, how many pounds are, is somebody going to lose? That's a good statistic, right? Um, how do they feel while they're losing weight and what's their mental outlook? And they, people say they feel better they, on this particular product. That's kind of nebulous, right? It's like, oh, great. You know, lots of people feel good, but how many pounds actually got lost, right? right. That's right. Yeah. And, and equally, what were the other contributing factors that are overlooked Correct. conveniently Correct. oftentimes? So, there, so that I think is dead on. The other thing, and I, I, I skipped this, this I think is the second point that we'll jump back to what we were just discussing is be sensitive to incentives. So specifically, if you get on the call with the sales rep from whatever vendor, and they say, our product is the best in the world, it's, it'll do this, that, and there's no problems. Uh, you should hang up and run away immediately. Why? Well, first of all, they're lying to you because <laughs> every product has a downside. And two, they're incentivized to sell you. And by the way, I lead a sales team. So I'm extremely sensitive to this when, or sensitive to this when I'm being sold to, but this is obvious, but I think what's not so obvious, Perry, and then please add additional color here is I'm looking at a piece of literature titled non-invasive body contouring that I believe was published by uh, two MDs, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Robinson. And in it is a section discussing radio frequency. So what you might see in advertising, for example, is 70% reduction of the adipose tissue. Okay, well, that's a third party uh, copy, let's say, so messaging. Let's get closer to the truth, the source. So here's what the source looks like in this case. So since 2015, a multipolar high frequency, this is a quote from the uh, research here, a multipolar high frequency non-contact RF device, whose name I'm going to leave oblivious for you know sake of not making an enemy here, has been an FDA approved therapy for non-invasive weight reduction. Uh, and a, let's see, Weiss, Weiss et al. performed a clinical study on, now get this, three Vietnamese pigs. Okay, pigs, yes, not humans, pigs. pigs, that illustrated its efficacy and safety in decreasing abdominal adipose tissue with a notable 70% reduction. Now, what do you think that entity is going to promulgate in their advertising? We reduce fat by 70%. Uh, not in okay. pigs. <laughs> not, yeah, exactly. Not quite. Right? Nice like we try. We made pigs skinnier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the point. And what happens is now bizarrely this and this is what baffles me about vendors is they'll they'll push that message out they'll be dishonest the customer buys they treat their customers now their customers are not seeing 70 percent, and everybody loses so this is why in perry i don't think you realize this but what you just told me i don't i can't believe i missed this getting close to the source is literally the antidote to information harvesting to make intelligent decisions to mitigate risk yes we should be charging for this wisdom, Mary. I should be paying you for this. This is this is godsend. Wow. Well, so you know, here, here's what scares people. Okay, people are scared by nomenclature. People are scared because they need to hire a lawyer to interpret the laws that are written in the revised statutes. And my suggestion is, don't be scared. They're just words. There are dictionaries. Look up the words as much as you can until you figure it out. Um, you don't need to be intimidated by words. Okay. There's, there's this lovely little thing. It's, it's a new technology. I don't know if many people have heard of it uh, called Google.com. Right? Yes. <laughs> For answers, a definition. And, and, it, and it has a dictionary attached to it. Right click, look up. It's yep. really simple. Okay. You don't even have to have a dictionary at hand. Just yep. right click, click. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Perry, look, you're, you're a busy man. You're running a, a massive spa. You've got a thousand things on the plate. And, uh, you know, I want to be sensitive to time. Is there any closing notes that you would leave the listener with to further color what we've discussed? Maybe a point that we missed that's worth sharing a message you would leave them with before I leave them with how to connect with you on the other side of that. 
pursue you pursue your dreams and execute because that's the thing we didn't cover right once you've gathered all your knowledge once you've decided that you're going to go down this direction and that there's no significant threat to you that that you can't overcome execute plan set targets set smaller things so that you can accomplish things daily or weekly so that you know because if you're going to have a large goal it might take a while to get there and you might be a little discouraged if you don't get to your goal so make sure you set smaller little targets um so that you can accomplish things right break it down a little bit so that at the end of the day you can go yes i'm that much closer to it but above all every day execute on your vision Beautifully put. I'm going to, I'm going to put that in a sentence because listeners, I have bad news for you. There's no 12 step program to execute. It's one step and here it is do. Okay. So what Perry just said, in case you missed it is you've got to decide then do there's your 12 step program. There it is. Do. That's, that's <laughs> it in a nutshell. <laughs> Well, this has been awesome. Perry, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I think the, 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 the really big takeaway today, you know, three things. Decide, what is your ideal scene? Figure out what that looks like. Take the time up front to measure twice, three times, and really think through what that in state looks like, the ideal scene and the goals that are surrounding that. And accept that you're going to have targets that you may or may not miss. If you're doing then you'll probably hit those targets. And when it comes to mitigating risk, get up near the edge of the seat of the source, let's say, and ignore third party, fourth party, seventh party bloggers that are incentivized to dupe you. Get up close to the truth. And lastly, do the work. I'm sorry, there's no magic pill secret formula, no. uh, and, fat and loss pill. You got to And that do takes work. courage. That's the, the, the key to that is courage. You have to have courage to do this. You have to be able to say, what if I fail? Well, okay, I'm going to fail. And you, and you fail. Okay. Next. And right. Exactly. And I failed. Right? What? Sorry. That's, that's called right? a seminar. Right. Okay. You know, yeah. what, what, what did, what did I learn from that? Now let me move forward. If your purpose is strong and your ideal scene is good, it doesn't matter how many times you fail because all that means is you've just gone down the wrong path and you learned something and you need to execute on a different path, but you will get there as long as you keep executing and keep working towards it. Well, listeners, I have bad news for you. Perry is no longer accepting coaching clients. He's too damn busy, but uh, if you can catch him, I'll leave him or invite Perry to share with you guys uh, and, and gals how to connect with him. Uh, so, so Perry, how can the listeners get in touch? And we'll close on that note. You can contact me through paradise salon spa wellness.com. That is who I am and where you can contact me at paradise salon spa wellness.com. Amazing. Perry. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I hope we can do it again soon. Sounds great to me, Austin. Thank you very much for having me today. Appreciate that. Of course. Take care. Bye-bye.